In this video, we're going to take a look at what is Solidity and how we can be able to use an online IDE like Remix to write our first smart contract. Then I'm also going to teach you the syntax of how we can be able to write Solidity code from scratch. If that sounds interesting, let's get started. So let's take a look at Solidity, which is a programming language that is designed to develop smart contracts that runs on Ethereum network. And smart contract is a digital agreement that cannot be changed. And for customer, when they're interacting with these blockchain network, each of these blockchain individual nodes are Ethereum virtual machines, which runs a smart contract. Unlike the Web 2.0, we have our customer interacting with our API layer. And these servers are owned by a single individual party. Whereas the Web 3.0, we have a blockchain of nodes. And these nodes are different servers, which are owned by different parties. Okay, so first we're going to visit a site called remix.ethereum.org, which is an online IDE that's similar to Visual Studio Code that we're going to run our Solidity code. So here you can see on the left side, we have our sidebar, which contains the file explorer where we can be able to view all the files that we have inside of our code. And then we also have our search bar where we can be able to search files. So here you can see on the left, uh, this is the file explorer and we are able to select a file and be able to see the file content. And on the bottom here, we can be able to see our terminal. And here you can see inside of our file, we have our code. So here, basically, uh, we're having a simple contract called simple storage. And here you can see we also specify the version of Solidity, which is 0.8.25. Okay, so first, let's take a look at how we can be able to create our smart contract in Solidity. So first, we can be able to create a contract by using the contract keyword. So here on line five, you can see that we are using the contract keyword followed by the name of the contract. So here we're given the name as counter. And here inside of this counter contract, uh, we basically define some methods, some functions, some values. And then here you can see we also specify the version of Solidity that we're using. So we're using 0.8.25. Here basically what this contract does is that we have a initial value. So when we create a, this instance of this contract, we set the counter to be zero. And then we also have a function that will uh, increment the counter by one. And then we can also have a function that gets the counter and returns that. So if we want to test this, we can be able to first uh, run this button here to compile. And as you can see on the left side, we have the check mark, basically it compiled successful. And then we also can be able to deploy and run our transaction. So once we get to this tab, we can be able to deploy this. And once we deploy this, you can see at the bottom here, we have an instance of our counter. Now here you can see we're, we can be able to interact with this on our Remix IDE. And here we can be able to see that if we were to uh, click on count, this will increment the count by one. And if we were to click on counter, this will return us the current value of our counter. And we can also be able to get, so we will be able to get the value of our current counter as well. So pretty much those two calls does the same thing. So if I click this, you can see the current initial value is zero. And if I were to click on the count and click on counter again, and you can see it's one, and if I were to click on get, you can see the value is also one. So, so basically this is how we create our contract, compile this, deploy this and test it inside of our Remix IDE. So let's take a look at constructor inside of contract. So very similar to constructor in a class like Java or C Sharp, we can be able to create a constructor. And this constructor is basically being called, it's like a function being called when we create an instance of this counter contract. And here inside of our constructor, you can see that we define the counter value to be zero when we first create the contract. So I can also define a different value. So for example, instance of contract is created, we can be able to set the counter to be something, for example, like 100. So if I were to control S or command S, uh, deploy this, and then you can see uh, that when we try to get a counter, where the initial value that we have is 100. So now let's take a look at access modifier in contract. So right now you can see inside of our contract, we have properties or variables and methods or functions. And inside of our variables or methods, we have this thing called public. And this public is access modifier, which basically means that it controls the visibility of this variable or method. So here you can see this variable is public or accessible to the public. Because if we were to deploy this, and if we were to open this instance, and you can see that all of these uh, variables or methods that's specified public is accessible to the public. If I were to change this to external, which basically means that this variable is not be used internally. 
And the other part is that external cannot be defined or cannot be used in variables, have to be used in functions. Let me give you an example of external. So let's say here right now, I define a, a variable called underscore count. And this count basically calls this get method, which return us the counter. And if I were to change this to an external access modifier, we will get a under, underlying score, we'll get an error, which basically means that get is not or not yet visible at this point, which basically means that external can only be used outside of the contract. Now, obviously we can get around this by using just say this dot git, which will basically get around this, but ideally we will want to use public, or if this is defined external, then we can only be used externally, not internally. Now, speaking of external, the opposite is internal. So internal basically means that we can be able to define a value and be able to use it in a derived or inherited class or inherited contract. So let's say if I have another contract and I have a variable called internal, I can be able to use that value. But for privates, it's not possible. So for example, let's say if I have a value called private, and in this case, um, this cannot be used outside of this contract. So right now you can see, uh, normally I have this counter, but let's say if I were to delete this, and then deploy this again. Obviously save and deploy this again. And here you can see that we do not get the variable counter and we cannot be able to access that because we changed it to private. And you can do it, you can, we can also change this to internal. And this basically means that this variable can be used in a derived or inherited class or inherited contract. And here is a cheat sheet of everything that I just talked about. So here you can see we have public, external, internal, private. These are the access modifier, which basically controls the visibility of variables and functions. And here you can see for modifier functions, we can use all four access modifiers. For variables, we cannot use external, but the rest. And, and here you can see that only the external access modifier cannot be used within the con current contract. And also you can see that external cannot be used in the derived contracts or the inherited contracts, as well as the private or the external access. You can see that private and internal cannot be used. Let's take a look at variables in Solidity. So because Solidity is a static type language, we have to define a data type for every variables that we define. So variables is basically a place where we store data and we need to define the data type of that place to store the data. And here you can see we have a text, which is a variable, and the type of that is a string. And you can see that this is the value of the text variable. And then we can also be able to define Booleans or integers or bytes or even addresses. And here you can see that um, we can also be able to define a constant variable. So here you can see these are be able to, to change that after we define, after we initiate this contract. But for constant variables like these ones, this cannot be changed after we define it. And similar to constant variables, immutable variables cannot be changed, but it can be defined in the constructor. So once you define it in constructor or in inline, you cannot be able to change that uh, after the contract is initiated. So let me give you an example. So here you can see I have a function and I'd be able to set. And this basically is a public method and we're trying to change the decimals and decimals are immutable. And here you can see we give an error because immutable variables can only be initiated in line or assigned directly in the constructor. So it cannot be changed after the contract is created. Look at modifier and contract. So here you can see we have three modifier, view, pure, and payable. So here you can see for view, we can be able to only view and read states and cannot modify it. So states, what I mean by that is whatever we have inside of our contract. So the properties and the variables that we have inside of our contract are considered state. And here you can see we can be able to only read them. And here we have a state or a variable called name and we only return it, but we do not modify it inside of this function. Now the other function is pure, which cannot read or write the state. So basically it cannot interact with the current properties or variables inside of our contract. So here you can see it takes two parameters and it returns the sum of those two parameters. The last one we have is ether, which basically means that this function will accept payment, will accept ether. So let's take a look at global variables in Solidity. So here you can see we have this keyword, which basically is a global variable. And this global variable referencing the current instance of the contract example. And here you can see we're converting this 
into an address and assign the contract address to this. And this message is also another global variable, which we can be able to access inside of our contract. And here you can see we can be able to access the sender property, which will give us the address of the payer. And we also have a transaction global variable, which also has a property called origin, which gave us the origin address. And we also have the value, which will give us the amount. So here you can see we also have block, which is another global variable. And this global variable can give us number. So the number, the block number, the timestamp, the ch chain ID. Here we'll basically return these values in a tuple. And speaking of global variables, here are some common ones. And there's the description for that. And now for local variables are a little different. So local variables are what we define inside of our function or code block. Let's take a look at array in Solidity. So similar to any other language, we can be able to define a array with a fixed size or dynamic array. And here you can see we create a dynamic array, which means that we don't have to specify the size of the array. And we have some elements in the array one, two, three. So in this case for L1, which is our list one, we can be able to push element, we can be able to pop element, which means that we can be able to remove an element in the, in the list. And we can also be able to access the element in the list and be able to get the length of the list. If it's a fixed size, for example, L2, so let's say if I were to change this to an L2, you can see that we're getting an error because you can see uh, we cannot be able to change or the size of the array once it's defined. Let's take a look at mappings. So mappings are very similar to hash table or hash map. So given a key, it has a corresponding value. And here you can see we have a mapping which defined here which we define using mapping, and then this is gonna be the key. So we have integer as a key, and then the string is a value data type. We have a name called my mapping. And we can also be able to interact with nested mapping. So to do so, we can be able to first specify the key, in this case is an integer, and the value is also a map. And then here this map, the key is integer, and the value is a string. And then to do so, you can see I can be able to access this by first specify the outer key and then followed by the inner key or the nested mapping key. And then to, to set the value is the same thing. And then to delete the value, that's how we also access it. So here you can see, I can also be able to interact with this in Remix. And I can be able to say, I want to get the key is one and the nested key is also one. And here right now the value is empty, but if I want to set it, I can be able to specify this and that the value is hello and then I can call this, and then if I were to get this value again, you can see the value is hello. And we can also be able to create our own data type called struct. So here you can see we're using a struct data type, which basically creates a struct called data. And this data has three properties. So we have A, which is an integer, B is a bytes, and a three is a mapping. And then here you can see, we can also be able to use our struct created data type inside of our any of our data types. So we can be able to use that inside of our contract. And here you can see we have a mapping, nested mapping, which in this case, the value, the nested value is an array of data, which is a struct that we just created. And we can be able to use it. Let's say we want to get data. Then we pass in the argument one, argument two, argument three. So this is going to be the data outer key and then the inner key and then the index of the data array. And then we're going to get the property. In this case, the property is A. And then in this function, we're basically return a tuple, which in this case, is only have A and B in it. Take a look at events in Solidity. So here you can see we have a contract called example, where we have a function called deposit, which takes an argument and it emits an event. And this is our events, which is called deposit, which accepts two arguments. So one is from and the other one is value. So this one, you can see once we emit an event, every services that subscribe to this event will get the latest value. So it's very similar to publish and subscribe. Pub sub, every service that subscribe to this event will receive the latest value. So here you can see we have a diagram where we have our EVM, which emits our event to our logs. And basically our external services will listen to this event inside of our logs. And the other thing is that we can be able to use index keyword to specify that this is the index of our event so that we can be able to search that inside of our logs. Let's take a look at how we handle error in Solidity. So here in the traditional in Java, we will start our function and then we will start our task one, our task two. And then for task three, let's say if it failed, then in this case, we can basically proceed with our stack task four, or it will basically do some error handling and log the error or whatever, right? That's how we handle error in programming language like Java. For Solidity EVM, the way how we handle error is that we will start our function, we will start 
complete our task one, task two, task three. But let's say if we get to task three and it failed, then what happened is that it will revert and go back to the original state. So since task one and task two are already done, it will undo those tasks, we'll basically roll back and go to the original state. Okay, so the first one is required. So require basically you can see here is a keyword and the first parameter here is just the condition and the second parameter is the error message. So here you can see we have a parameter and then we check to see if age is above or equal to 18. And if it's not, then we will throw an error. If it is, then we will continue our code. So very similar to require, we also have revert, which basically means that we will throw an error and revert the logic, revert the actions back to square one. So here you can see we have a function called transfer ownership, and we have our owner here, and then check to see if the message dot sender, if it doesn't equal to the owner, then we will throw it an error or revert, not an owner. So I can also specify the error message inside of the parameter as well. And here you can see I can also be able to do the same with require. So we check to see if this is equal to the sender. If it's not equal, if this condition is false, then this will be the error message. So the other way we can be able to handle error message is using try catch. So here you can see we have a try block and a catch block. And we are calling a function called get to. And then depends on the response of this function. If it succeeds, then we'll basically execute what we have inside of our try try block. And if it failed, then we will execute what we have inside of our catch block. And here you can see we're basically trying to get the value. And then we're going to do an addition and then try to return the new value. If this function response failed, then we can be able to handle our error message inside of our catch block. And we can be able to use our code to handle that. So now let's take a look at inheritance. So here you can see we have our base contract and our subcontract. And our subcontract is basically using the base contract which inherit from the base contract by using the is keyword and here you can see the subcontract will inherit the properties like a and then it will basically also have his own property like b and here you can see if i deploy this uh, for the base contract we all only have the property a and then for the subcontract we have the property a and property b and we can also be able to override functions from our parent contract. So here you can see we have an example of a base contract, which is a virtual func which has a virtual function called foo. And then this will basically increment a by two. And then here you can see we also have a subcontract, which also has a function called foo, which overrides this parent function. And basically what it does is that it changed the logic by, over by adding the a property by one. So now you can see if I were to click on A, you can see currently the value is zero. But if I click on foo, so if I click on this and then get it again, you can see that the value is only one, which only increment A by one. And for the derived contract, we can also be able to use a super keyword to access what we have inside of our parent uh, contract. So here you can see we have a super keyword and trying to call the foo from the parent contract and then we're trying to increment a by one. So in, in this case, if I were to deploy this and then try to call the function foo, what's gonna happen is that this will basically call the parent function and then we'll also call, uh, we'll basically also increment a by one, a is equal to three. And here you can see we have a is equal to three. And the other part is that we can be able to use abstract contract by using the abstract keyword. And we can also be able to use interface inside of our contract. So here you can see we have our interface called iContract. And this iContract has a method called increment, which we haven't defined. So basically in this case, we have a contract that inherited or implements this interface. And, it ha and basically it will override this method and give a definition for this method, which in this case, it will increment the count by one. And basically you can see this is how we build a use interface inside of our contract.